And now for progressive group requests swift response to the conflict between the Chekosis and Concombes in the Chiripone district. Dance hall artists Stone Boy and Shatawale charged over brawl at this year's Vodafone Ghana Music Awards. President Kufuado signs right to information bill into law. Also ahead this evening, pressure group Free Media Vanguard gives National Communication Authority one week to reverse its decision in shutting down some radio stations. President, uh, also we're going to the uh, sports this evening where Somajan's retirement is still trending and many reactions greeting that particular announcement yesterday. And on the international front, President Donald Trump warns Iran would be met with great force if it attacked U.S. interests in the Middle East. Stay with us here on News 360. We've got the details of these and much more news. As always, you can watch our bulletin on our website. It's 3news.com. And on Facebook, it's TV3Ghana. Just bear in mind as well, we're live on DSTV channel 279 as well. So keep your thoughts coming through as we're live and interactive. The vice chairman of the ANUFO progressive group, Swale Amidu, is calling on government to swiftly uh, respond to the conflict between the Chekosis and the Konkombes in the Chiripone district. At the news conference in the northern regional capital, Tamale, he said vulnerable groups have nowhere to turn to after several houses were burnt down. Here's a report by Zubeda Smile. Reports indicate that residents of Nabiri, Nakperi, Naburuku, Namba and many others are deserting their communities to neighboring Togo after 15 communities in the Tripone district are alleged to have been raised. The Tripone district coordinating director Alaji al Hassan Husseini and his driver are allegedly to have been shot by a faction in the conflict. The vice chairman of an awful progressive group, Swalu Amidu, indicated the situation is more serious than it has been reported. He said women and children are fleeing as more communities are under attack. He claims the security situation is poor, making it difficult for vulnerable groups to stay in the area and requested government to intervene. Five persons have been arrested over the conflict. Uh, we're trying to work on the telephone lines now. Speak to DSP Steve Tanko. He speaks for the uh, Northern Regional Police Command. Uh, he joins me on the telephone. DSP Steve Tanko, thank you for time this evening. Now, this comes barely 24 hours after the president uh, was in that particular region, specifically the Northeast region. Now, we understand some 13 people have been arrested. Uh, can you update us on this and indeed confirm this figure and tell us what the current situation is where you are? Yeah, thank you very much. And good evening to your viewers. Yeah, so far, both police and military, our combined efforts, we've been able to arrest eight persons. Five of them were taken to court this morning. The eight are on their way from Chirponi to Tamale, and their cases will be referred to regional CID, and they will investigate their cases and put them before court. They are believed to be part of the people who are fueling the conflict in the area, and these are made up of both concombers and uh, chocosis. And we are doing everything possible to ensure that the situation is brought under total control. Uh, we have been patrolling widely, taking intelligence on the ground, listening to distress calls and reacting to them. And that has prevented a lot of uh, burnings that would have happened in the communities in the interior. Now, we see pictures on social media of houses being burnt and people fleeing the area. Now, what's the level of police presence uh, in the area, I mean, these two areas? Because this yeah. is not the first time such a thing is happening in these two communities. The level of police and military presence in the area is very huge and extensive. But you agree with me that Sirponi and Sabuba district combined. It's not a small landmass. It is a very vast landmass. There are places that are not even motorable to even uh, strong uh, vehicles. But that notwithstanding, 
we are doing our very best at, at, at some point our men will have to try to be able to assess some of the communities and we are everywhere we are everywhere but you understand that we can't be everywhere at the same time it is patrols that that we are organizing at these vast areas and we've been man we've managed so well to bring the situation under some controls so that would a little will be able to deal with the situation and peace will return well but but this incident happened on saturday from the information we're picking there was some burning today as well so are you considering calling for reinforcement? I mean, because of the continuous occurrence of this particular since Saturday? Yeah, we have a lot of men on the ground as I speak to you. And uh, my brother, I tell you that if we should bring all policemen in the three northern regions to the police, we still cannot occupy every nick and cranny in the area. But we need to do effective patrols, which we are doing. We are also appealing to both the Kunkumbers and the Chukosis to give peace a chance to understand that the best way out of this is to resolve their, their conflict uh, using, the, uh, using the courts, using the police, using traditional authorities, using relevant organizations, but not to uh, pick arms at the least opportunity. That is not the way to go. So if these appeals do not sing down well to them, uh, we have a problem at our hands. No matter the number of 50% that will be employed in the area or deployed in the area, it still be difficult. But uh, our men on the ground have been very professional. They have been very uh, proactive and they've been conducting extensive patrols, and that has even uh, helped to bring the situation under control. Uh, any any casualties since this incident on Saturday? Yeah, so far we have we have recorded about three injuries and also a death. Sad. Yes, we. I want to thank you very much. Uh, we have our eyes on on this particular situation. Uh, in the in subsequent bulletins, we get an update on the DSP. You see, Tanko speaks for the Northern Regional Police Command. So, some other top stories this evening. As the police is requesting dancehall artist Charles Niama Mensah, known in showbiz circles as Shatawale, to submit his gun and license. Police investigators have already retrieved the gun used by fellow dancehall artist Livingstone Statikla, popularly known as Stone Boy, in his license. Komla Kluche has the following report. So we'll certainly bring you the full detailed reports by Kamala Kluche on that issue shortly. Stay with us. Right on. Now, to, uh, some more stories. Pressure group Free Media Vanguard has given the National Communications Authority, NCA, a weak ultimatum to reverse its decision in taking some radio stations off air over what it described as authorization infractions. The group, in a protest, accused the ruling NPP government of using state agencies to suppress Media Freedom, here's a report by Messi Dali Local. The National Communications Authority, NCA, has within two weeks closed down nine radio stations for breaching what it says are provisions of the country's electronic communication regulations. Pressure group Free Media Vanguard staged a protest to register its displeasure over the closure of the radio stations. The protesters moved from the Elwak Sports Stadium through 37 to the headquarters of the NTA at Airport City. The group insists the move by the NTA is an abuse of its powers and a suppression of press freedom. We are not saying that the NTA doing its job is a bad thing. We're not people who are against the rule of the law. We're rather talking about the manner in which the National Communications Authority moved in to close down the radio station, especially when these radio stations managers have indicated that on several occasions they've made themselves available to go through the process. In the case of Radio XYZ, they had bankers draft ready. In the case of Radio Gold, they were available. But the only thing was that they were not given the opportunity. So it sends a bad signal out there that there's a diabolical intention for which the NCA moved it. Convener of the group Prince Minka, while presenting the petition, said the group would continue to embark on a series of actions, including legal, should the NCA fail to act within seven days. 
This is a country that once upon a time was celebrated across the length and breadth of the world as far as media freedom is concerned. You should not be a part of those who go down in history destroying freedom, freedoms of men or in the name of law. A deputy director of the NCA, Olivia Quarte, who received the petition, promised to have their concerns forwarded for attention. I, I understand this. We receive this in the name of the authority and we will do what is right. Managers of the radio stations which have been shut down were also present. It's also increasingly becoming clear that this government is clamping down on the expression of free speech, particularly people whose, whose speech is unpleasant for the administration. That is worrying, that is dictatorial, this is a constitutional democracy and that kind of behavior ought not be countenanced. The protest was dubbed March for Free Expression. And let's now return to the detailed reports on one of our top stories as the police is requesting dance on artiste Ch Charles Ni Ama Mensa, known in showbiz circles as Shata Wale, to submit his gun and license. Police investigators have already retrieved the gun used by fellow dance on artiste Livingstone Satekla, popularly known as Stone Boy, and his license. Here's Komla Klutre's report. Stone Boy arrived in the company of his manager. Avoiding the media and much attention, he makes an entry into the CID office with his lawyer where he was suspected to report on Tuesday, charged with unlawful conduct and possession of arms without authority. His family was consoling. Charles Niyama Mensa, a.k.a. Shatawale, has been charged with unlawful conduct and reported to the Crown Region Police in the company of his fans, Bulldog, Shatawale's former manager in a hearty embrace with Stone Boy's manager Black City before meeting the CID. <laughs> Sources at the CID have confirmed both artists have authorization to possess firearms. Meanwhile, the police have taken a statement from the host of Saturday's Vodafone Ghana Music Awards, Kwame Sefa Kaim, as a witness to the fracas on Saturday. Broadcaster Abeku Santana, who presented the award to Stoneboy just before the incident, is expected to give a statement. President Kofuado has assented to the Right to Information Act two months after its passage by Parliament. The law will now afford the media and the public access to information from next January. The law is meant to operationalize Article 21, Subsection 1, F of the Constitution, which states that all persons shall have the right to information subject to some qualifications and laws as are necessary in a democratic society. Properly applied, it should enhance the quality of governance in our country and provide a critical tool in the fight against corruption in public life. The Parliament has quite rightly provided that the Act should come into effect in the next financial year, i.e. January 2020, because there are financial consequences in the implementation of the law in order to give the public treasury the opportunity to make the necessary allocations to enable the act to be effective. I'm very happy that this law has finally been passed. And I did make the commitment that when it was brought to me, I would give my assent to it right away. It was in fact brought to me yesterday afternoon. But on second thought, I felt that I should sign it in the plain view of the Ghanaian people for you to know that this long, winding parliamentary process has finally come to an end. Long live Ghanaian democracy. May God bless our nation and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. 
We'll stay with the presidency as President Akufuado has inspected work on the ongoing desilting and dredging of the Odor Channel at Circle in Accra. The project ex is expected to restore the drainage efficiency and holding capacity of the channel and the lagoon to avert flooding. In June 2016, a two-year contract was awarded to Dredge Masters Limited, a subsidiary of Zoom Lion Ghana, for the desilting and dredging of the Odor Channel and restoration of the Koli Lagoon to avert the perennial flooding in Accra under the Accra Sanitary Sewer Storm Drainage Elevation Project. Dredging works under the initial contract was completed in March 2017 with designs on civil works ongoing. The client, under the initial agreement in February 2019, approved a two years extension for the maintenance dredging of the Odor Channel and Kole Lagoon under the same scope. From there, the president inspected work on the storm drain at Kanishi First Light. The 7 million City World Bank funded project will link the roadside and underground drains to address the perennial water spillage. The construction of the 600-meter drain by Velos Construction Company, expected to be completed by next month, is intended to reduce the perennial flooding in the area. This is being seen as an environmental sanitation challenge. And so with collaboration with all relevant stakeholders, we decided to remove the bottleneck and also channelize the drain about 630 meters stretch upstream to collect all the water and then channel it into the existing drain that is lying across the main road. And this has successfully been done. And the drain is what you see there. The channel is about um, 2 meter by 1.6, 2 of it. So eventually it's about 4 meter with 1.8 meters deep. And that is the um, channel size. It is connecting an existing um, drain, which has the same size underground with the, on, along the, the road. Department of Urban Roads under the Ministry of Roads and Highways in collaboration with the Ministry of Sanitation and Water Resources are the supervisors of the project. And in Kumasi, two children are reported missing following the downpour in parts of the Ashanti region Monday afternoon. A national disaster management organization, NADMO search team, and officials of the Municipal Assembly are at Tafo Adompem and uh, Dichemso are on a rescue mission. Here's a report by Benjamin Edu. The two children reported missing are nine-year-old girl Shamsia and eight-year-old Kwabna Boating. Two pregnant women and five children were rescued at Borkrom E line after they were trapped in their rooms. Most of the affected houses in the area have been put up on waterways. Many residents in flat zone areas have been displaced as houses got submerged. The rain, which lasted two and a half hours, flooded areas including Amanfrum, Oshim, Atonsu S Line, Crowfrum, and Loga Junction, Bokrom, and Tafupankrono. The flood waters took over roads, making it difficult for vehicles to move. Commuters were stuck in traffic, with some having to trek home. Now, government has requested the consortium of banks to reschedule payments for the construction of four hostels by the University of Ghana. But the president of the University of Ghana branch of UTAG, Harry Agbanu, wants the hostels privatized. The meeting between the stakeholders were held behind closed doors. It emerged that government, through the Ministry of Education, has requested for additional time. It pleaded with a consortium of banks not to drag the University of Ghana to court after May 31. But the consortium of banks are yet to agree to the decision. The Ministry of Education has indicated again its decision not to bear the over 500 million cities cost incurred. Its public relations officer, Eko Vincent Asifua, said the sector ministry will only facilitate its payment. The government, as we speak, has not taken any decision whatsoever to take or perhaps it will absorb the debt. Rather, government feels that it's a matter of public interest. And because it's a matter of public interest, government will have to come in to make sure that the right things are being done so that our students who find themselves in the University of Ghana will not have any cause to worry. Already, the delay in repaying the loan has triggered discontent on the front of lecturers on campus. 
the president and investor of Ghana branch of UTAC, Dr. Harry Agbanu, rather wants the hostels privatized. We are private hostels yeah. on campus that students are occupying and paying the right rent. And these hostels are able to, you know, maintain themselves and make some small money for the company. Why can't the ones built by University of Ghana with loan also not be treated as such. He said government in 2011 agreed to assist the University of Ghana to pay off the cost but failed. Government should absorb the cost. We are talking about 2007 and we are in uh, 2019. If government were willing or able to do that, they would have done that long ago. That amount wouldn't have, wouldn't have escalated from 43 million to 523 million as, as of today, and probably even more. So to be fair to the banks and to be fair to the university, I think that there must be a way out of this. And the only way is that the, the whole search will be managed as a commercial entity. In response, the public relations officer of the ministry pointed out that the current administration is not aware of any such arrangement. It is on the lapse of the University Council to make the right decision so that this particular debt is paid within the time frame that they are supposed to be paid. There should be a clear cut oversight responsibility on the management of our universities because there cannot be an autonomy without any checks and balances. And that is what we have always been saying. And the Minister of Education has always been saying that it cannot be that because you're autonomous, government cannot have a hand in how you manage your schools. In another development, UTAC says it has received letters from the Minister of Finance and Education on the payment of the 2018-2019 book and research allowance. On our MTN video report tonight, our citizen journalist Ayeta Abdul Samed Akaluti reports on the poor state of the road at Bongo Namu in the Upper East region. This road was constructed in the year 2008. Up to now, nothing has been done on it. And it is a road that links the people of Akubia and Abelinzanga. But you can see the nature of this road due to the heavy downpour and has even destroyed some part of the farmlands where people used to cultivate their crops. People now use it for open defecation. Cholera is the major disease that always affects us. The government and the DCE come to our aid. This is concerned citizen Ayata Abdul Somed Akaluti reporting from Bongo Namo. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp number 055-1433-044. Hello, good evening and welcome to the business news segment here on News 360. My name is Park Kutiasari. Thanks very much for making a date with us. Now, the Ghana National Gas Company has commenced the testing and commission of gas pipelines for the reserve flow projects. The project, when completed, would enable the company to transport dense gas from its regulating and metering station in Takwadi through Wapco pipelines to gas-powered plants in Tema. The reverse flow project is to ensure that dense gas is transported from Abwazi Power Enclave to gas powered plants in Tema whenever there is an interruption in gas supply from Wapco. Briefing the media on the status of work, the station manager for Takradi Regulating and Metering Station for Ghana Gas, Emmanuel Ekon, said testing and commissioning of gas pipelines for the reverse flow project commenced on Thursday, May 16, with a flow of 37 million square feet daily. WAPCO is using that 37 to pressurize their station. It's gradual, it takes number of days 
to be able to stabilize the station before they can move ahead to the offshore pipeline. Head of communications for Ghana Gas Company, Nese Wusu Bempa, expressed the company's resolve at ensuring there's no interruption in power supply. The tying has been completed and going forward, the reverse flow has also been completed and we're going to uh, make sure that there's not going to be any problem when it could tell us that they don't have enough gas available. There will be more gas flowing about between 30 and 60 which is very significant to help us uh, generate electricity. The deadline for the project was reviewed from the second quarter of 2018 to June this year. In other news, Chairman of the National Development Planning Commission, Professor Stephen Adai, has blamed corporate governance more practices in the country on political interference. Addressing the fourth Ghana CEO summit in Accra, he noted that the composition of boards on political relations uh, do not merit uh, the, the growth of companies in the country. The collapse of some banks in the country in 2018 has largely been attributed to poor corporate governance practices. Companies have, as a result, been taxed to engage in best corporate practices. The Companies Act of 1969 has been amended to guide companies in this regard. Its amendment, among other things, is intended to advance best practices in corporate governance. Chairman of the National Development Planning Commission, Professor Stephen Aday, linked political interference in many state institutions to bad managerial decisions. We attribute it to political interference. That is why we don't have Ghana Airways. That is why we don't have Black Star Lines. That is why Tema Oil Refinery borrows to pay bonus. That is why Cocoa Marketing Board it's in billions of debt. And yet last year, they wanted the board to borrow to pay the bonus. President of Future Fit Leaders, Celia P.J. Collins, encouraged management of firms to drive long-term survival by investing in the development of its best employees to promote continuity. Every great leader reproduces after themselves. They reproduce after what they see the future will need. And I think there is a great need for us to invest in millennials right now. In the next 10 years, the people in the university will become heads of industry. Every leader that does not invest in the future has failed somewhere. Legacy is not assumed. It has to be intentional. The CEO Summit is an annual conference of corporate and institutional CEOs designed to provide a common platform for deliberations and development of best practices in the world of business. Legacy is not assumed, it must be intentional. Great uh, thought there. Now, in other news, the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research and the Carroll Center for Globalization recommends that policies pursuing gender equality should consider giving targeted support to female entrepreneurs whose businesses have ex export potential. Now, both institutes in their recent study on whether trade can foster development has revealed that gender inequality is present at various levels of economic activities. The study reveals that SMEs provide about 85% of manufacturing employment and contribute about 70% of the country's GDP. It also reveals that apart from signs of spillover effect from better performing firms, the importance of material input is not found to benefit SMEs in any way. Female-owned SMEs, on the other hand, do not only have a limited potential to grow and enter the export market than male-owned businesses, but they also fail to reap the gains of exporting when they do. Senior Research Fellow at ESE, Dr. Charles Aka, who is also one of the authors of the study, urged policymakers to invest more in data collection to facilitate quality empirical research. Surprising that out of 880 firms that we surveyed, uh, just about 20 of them are importing inputs, uh, which is quite low. Uh, but these 20 firms are actually importing quite a lot. Uh, so we would like to see uh, why are firms not importing input since it's beneficial. And why is it that the few firms that are importing don't seem to, to realize the benefits of the import? And that's, that will require some further studies uh, for policymakers to address. But I think the, the main challenge has to do with the cost of importing which is the, has to do with the exchange rate and also has to do with the duties that they have to pay. President of the Private Enterprise Federation, Nano Sebunsu, urged government to diversify exports to rake in more revenue. We can trade gold as much as we want. One 
million an ounce. The impact doesn't come to Ghana. The impact is only in the measurement of GDP. The ownership goes to the overseas owners. So the Ghanaians don't benefit apart from the royalties and all. Uh, but if you look at cocoa, and we trade cocoa, if we add value, we trade cocoa, the impact comes in because the value of the cocoa comes to the owners of that cocoa. So once you're doing trading and a policy on trading, the emphasis should be homegrown, home ownership of the trade, tradable products. The study was funded by the German Development Corporation. That's it for the very latest in business news. For more business news stories, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. My name is Parkus Yasari. <laughs> well, and we are black and proud, yeah. at least. Yes, my name is Alfred Okansi. I'm Natalie Ford. Thanks so much for watching. There's lots more news on our website, 3news.com. I'm black and proud. Have a great evening.